was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you oh, You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness And do you call my name And I ran out of that way Out of the darkness To your glorious day Come on, put your hands together. Say amen all together. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ah, lift you up. Our kindness you have poured out grace brought me out of darkness.
Welcome, uh, welcome back to the point online. We're so yeah. glad you're here, wherever you're watching from. Uh, wow, yeah. it's such a blessing to to be able to communicate with you and 
and be able to uh, chat with you right now. Our yeah. hosts, our online hosts are right there with you. So make sure you shout out and put some favorite emojis, as Deanna Ooh, would say. I like emojis. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> yes, yeah. she does. So make sure you connect with us in the chat box. Again, put those emojis, all the engagement, and then also through the pointchurch.net slash connect. That's definitely where you'll um, really make your first connection or continued connection through that uh, online uh, connection card. Mm -hmm. We we know whether you're new, whether you've had like a prayer request. Tell them about uh, prayer requests. Though. Yeah. So wherever you're at, whatever language you speak, whatever country, if, yeah. even if you're on Mars, uh, we're going to pray Mars. for you. But the only way, <laughs> yes, even Mars. <laughs> but the only way that we can do that, I mean, you could be on the International Space Station, but you have to fill out the communication sure. card so we know what your prayer request is so we can pray for you. But yeah. We promise you that we will. That would be really cool, actually, get a prayer request from the International Space All right, you guys, share this with every <laughs> six degrees of six separation. Degrees of separation say. Somebody knows someone who's an astronaut that out would there. Be really, really cool. Anywho, have them so send it to us we're with proof. It, we're speaking it into Existence. reality. Okay, so also baptism. If you're ready to take your next step of faith, let us know through that connection card as well. Um, our next baptism is November 8th, mm -hmm. but um, you can absolutely jump in. We're actually doing things a little bit differently. We're like doing some digital baptisms, just yeah. pre recording. And we actually had. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a baptism, mm -hmm. and you probably saw the video. If not, jump back to that service. Yeah. And what's really cool is you could really do this wherever you're at. You mm -hmm. could be in your bathtub, your swimming pool, a yeah. lake if it's not too cold, unless you're doing a polar <laughs> plunge <laughs> baptism. But whatever you do, uh, communicate with us. Let us know that you yeah. want to be a part of that. We'll walk you through it, and we'll help you get it done, really and we will share it with the world so the yeah. world can see what God has done in your life. Very cool. Well, I will pray us out. Okay. All right. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity to come together once again. God, we just open our hearts, open our ears, our minds to what you have for us to receive today. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Do you like playing board games? You know, some games like Candyland or Shoots and Ladders or Bingo or Bunko. I mean, they're just pure luck. You know, a five-year-old kid with a, with a lucky dice roll can beat a full-grown adult. For me, I like strategy games, you know, like chess, but, but nobody wants to play chess. I mean, it's too serious. You know, it's just people like thinking and staring at a board, right? You know, uh, seriously, have you ever seen a chess player laugh? Well, I have once. Uh, one of my friends who was over at the house and he brought his 10 year old son with him and, and Cody, this boy, he, he took one look at the chess set we got out on our coffee table and, and he challenged me to play. Now, I'm a decent chess player, and I'm actually pretty confident when I play 10-year-olds. So I sit down across from Cody, and I start with a basic opening move, pawn to d4. And instantly, Cody mirrors my move with his pawn. So I'm like, game on, kiddo. And I move my knight to c3. And Cody, he doesn't move one of his pieces. No, he reaches out and just takes my knight off the board. Now, this is the first time I've ever encountered a knight kidnapping move. So I say, Cody, what's that? And he explains. He says, well, that square is a lava pit. Your knight stepped in the lava pit. He died and the horse he rode in on is dead. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, this was clue one that this game may not follow the ordinary rules of chess. And Cody says, your move. So I look at the pawn he moved to d5 and I flick it off the board with my finger. I said, my pawn shot your pawn with a laser gun. Boom. And this kid, he, he puts his pawn right back on the board and he takes my pawn off. My pawn had a laser shield. Your laser bounced back and killed your guy. <laughs> I realize, okay, this is not chess. This is not strategy. I'm in a battle of imagination <laughs> with a 10-year-old. And so I slide my queen out on the board and I knock his entire row of pawns off. My queen packs a machine gun, I tell him. Now, if you've never played chess, this is not how it's done. Chess has rules. Chess has defined moves. Chess is all strategy, but not this game, not this kid. Cody does not even pause. It's like he's encountered my machine gun queen before. He reaches over, he grabs a post-it note, and he writes the word God on it. And he sticks it on his king, and he sweeps all my pieces off the board. And I'm like, what is that move? And he says, well, you're a pastor, you should know. I got God, so you know I win. <laughs> and his dad, he says, well, Ray, you got to admit, that's a pretty good move right there. Now, I'm competitive, and this kid has now got me riled up. So I tell his dad, well, you get ready to wipe your kid's tears because I am not done. 
See, I noticed that Cody spelled God with a lowercase g. So I grab my own post-it note, I write capital G God on it, and I put it on my king, and I put all my pieces back on the board. And this kid, he's like, no, 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 you can't do that. I already have God. But I go, well, you got a lowercase God. You got an idol worship God. I got the real God, and the real God has just resurrected all my players. <laughs> and you'd think that would end the game, but it just kept going. We had hijacked a chess set with our imaginations and creations created our own rules, our own universe. And I share that little story because I wonder how many of us do that? How many of us just stick God on a game piece, maybe even call him king, and just do what we want in our lives, play by our own rules and expect that we're going to win? You see, before you play a game, you have to know the rules. Before you start, you have to know what the goal is, how to win, how do you finish. Now, you parents, you know this. Any game you buy for the kids, you got to get out the rule book. You got to read it. You got to teach the rules of the kids. I mean, if you play a game without knowing the purpose, if you play not knowing how to win, then you're playing chess with Cody, right? You, you don't know what you're playing for. You're just making it all up as you go. Today, I want to help you understand this game called life, your life, my life. How is it that we should play this game we live in? How do we win? How do we finish, right? And, and to read the directions for this game, I want us to look at the first three pages of the Bible and the last page. God, the creator of our life, has given us instructions on how to play the game. So if you got a Bible, join me. Let's learn how to play the game of life. First three pages and then the last page. You know, while you're, you're looking for that Bible, let me congratulate you on how well that you're wearing uh, your wristband. You know, this is a series called Your Best Life Now. And if you don't have one of these wristbands, put hashtag wristband in the feed. We'll mail it to you anywhere in the world. We'll wear the band through the series and then just every time you look at it, just ask God, hey, how do I live my best life now? Today, we're going to learn a lot on how to do that. Today, I'm going to give you Christianity in four pages. By the time we're done today, you're going to know what this whole God thing is about and what God intends for your life. All right, page one, Genesis 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is the famous description of, of creation. Page one of the Bible tells us how God set up the game board. It reminds us of how life on earth began. Do you know, ever since the advent of the Hubble telescope, scientists have realized that what the Bible says is true, that everything in the universe has started at a specific point in time. There's extraordinary agreement with science here. In fact, the universe is still spreading out gradually from a specific origin. Science calls that point the what? The Big Bang. Not Big Bang Theory, that's uh, like Sheldon's TV show. No, what page one says, and science agrees, is that everything we are, everything we see, everything we do, all that this planet revolves around originated at a single point. First, there was nothing. No game pieces, no game board, no players, no rules, no nothing. Page one says that. Science agrees with that. Where page one and science differ is that page one simply goes one step beyond the bounds of science. And it helps us see that into a state of nothingness, God spoke and created all things. God set up the game board. God designed life. There's a designer behind the design, a creator behind the creation. Science, it doesn't go to this degree. It's not the job of science to do that, but it's the job of faith to do that. And page one tells us that nothingness is the original state of the universe, but sitting outside of nothing was a creator who spoke into that nothing and created a lot of somethings. So God speaks and creates from nothing all that exists. Now, a few more details on how God set up the board. Genesis 1.27 tells us God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So page one, God sets up a board called earth. Put humans on it that were created in the image of day, the image of God, that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Page two of the Bible tells us God's rules for the game. Genesis 2, 8. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man that he had formed. 
The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Check out that last phrase, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you went to church as a grade school kid, I mean, you might have seen this story done on the flannel board. I remember my Sunday school teachers like picking up cut out felt pieces and, and like sticking them up on this felt board. I mean, we had gigabytes of felt technology back then, right? The teacher would, would put up this little felt garden, uh, you know, like beautiful paradise, and there'd be like one tree in the middle of the garden with fruit on it. And Adam and Eve, it'd be right there with that tree in the garden, you know, dressed, of course, you know, in some of the most elaborate creative fashioning of leaves you'd ever seen, like... We know that before Adam and Eve sinned, they were like two-year-olds hopping out of the tub and running around the house like little nudists, you know, unaware of their nakedness, but not in the Baptist church I grew up in. No, Adam had a three-piece leaf suit on and Eve had like a leaf dress down to her ankles. I mean, Baptists, they do a real good job of covering up page one and two, you know, let's so make sure kids don't really see the real Adam and Eve. Let's tidy that up, keep the questions down, right? Anyway, you, you read page two and you realize, wait, there's not just one tree in that garden. There's a whole forest. You see it? Page two, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So we got this whole forest there. And then in one spot, there's two trees. And those two trees get names. There's the tree of life. That's tree number one. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's tree two. These trees are a big deal. Genesis 2.16 says the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So that's how the game board's set up. And if you go to page three, we broke the very first rule God set. What did God say not to do? Well, that's exactly what we did. Page three of the Bible tells us how we broke the rules. This is Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. They desired what they should not desire and they ate it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but Point Church, my whole life has been wrapped up in page three. I get to choose what I think is good, what is pleasing, and what is desirable. I promise you, I choose it. You see, we might be thousands of years away from page three, but we are all choosing to break the rules. And we moan about it. I mean, why does God get to make the rules? <laughs> why does he get to say what's good? Who has the right to tell me what's pleasing and what's not? I mean, this is the 21st century. I'm not going to be able to let some antiquated old book tell me what I can and cannot do, what I can and cannot desire. I get to choose that. But the truth is, we didn't make the rules, and there are consequences for breaking them. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, they're opened, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves, and, and they hid from God among the trees of the garden. Oh, now, now we're using the trees to hide. And the entire board is set up in three pages. God sets up the board, puts humans in the prime position, says, I created you to be like me. I made you in my image. I'm a God of love. So I want you to experience perfect love, perfect love with me and perfect love with each other. That's the game of life. And the second we get on the first square of the game board, we decide we're going to make up our own rules. Like we're Ray and Cody, <laughs> do life our own way. And when we do, we mess stuff up and we realize we're naked and ruin the whole game. And then we're so full of guilt and shame over messing up the game, we start a lifelong game of hide and seek with God and with each other too. Now, I have this facade that says, well, I'm Ray Harris. I'm, I'm going to show you the best part of me. I mean, it's not the whole me. It's just the part I'm comfortable with you seeing, right? I'll just pretend the rest of me doesn't exist because, well, I'm afraid you won't like me if you see it. This is not just me. This is all of us. We've put up these shields to deflect our true identity and, and we hide. Not only from God, we hide from each other. Why do we hide? Because we know we've done wrong. That's guilt. And because we know we are wrong. That's shame. Now, if you're a thinker, and I know some of you, you, you really think things through, then you really got to ask the question, why would God if he knew the tree was going to set into motion all of this mess we're in, why would he put that tree in the garden in the first place? I mean, what kind of loving God allows all the mess that has come from eating from that tree, all the hatred, all the abuse, the addiction, the betrayal, the molestation, the rejection? 
Well, friends, the answer is God made you in his image. He is a God of love. He wants you to love him and to love each other. And it doesn't take too many years beyond our adolescence to realize love, it's not a feeling. Love, it's not an emotion. Love is a choice. For there to be love, there must be choice. So God put a choice in the garden. He had to, or there could not be love. If God made us to love, then there has to be a choice to, to unlove. I mean, if we have a choice to love, there must be a choice to abuse. If there is a choice to love, there must be a choice to reject, to hurt, to suffer. And the God of love who set up the board, who made you in his image, wanted you to experience love so much that he allowed choice. So we made the choice to break the rule so we get the penalty. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife and you ate fruit from the tree of which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you'll return. See, God said the result of messing up, it's brokenness. There's a brokenness in your marriage, in your work, in your parenting, in your finances. There's pain and toil and suffering and sweat and tears. And God saw our brokenness. God knew. We broke the rule. But we have a God that loves us so much. He said, let me just make a change to the game I created for you. And now, let's look at the end of page 3. This is Genesis 3.22. God said, The man, he's now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, those are angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to what? To the tree of life. You know, that wasn't on the flannel graph when I was a kid. Like, we all knew there was one tree you can't eat from, but most of us never knew about the other tree, the tree of life. But God knew. God knew. If he didn't make a change to the game, we'd be jumanji right? Forever. We'd be stuck in the game with no way out. We'd be stuck in our brokenness and our pain and our toil and our suffering forever. So what God does is he changes the board. He blocks the way to the tree of life so we can't get anywhere near that tree of immortality. And so we're not stuck in that game forever. All right, that's pages one to three. That's how the board is set up. And that's the first moves in the games that were made. Now, here's a question for you. Where's that tree of life now? I mean, is there some fountain of youth that uh, I mean, we could find? Now, Go to the very last page of the Bible, to the book of Revelation chapter 22. Realize the first three pages are how the board is set up and how the first moves went. And the entire middle of the book is not everything we've got to do to get back to God. No, in the middle of the book is all that God has done to get to us in spite of how messed up we've started. God says, look, this is the length of what I do uh, to get to you. And then God says, let me remind you of something I told you all the way back on page two. And he reminds us on the last page. This is Revelation chapter 22, verse one. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. It's clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Catch this, on each side of the river stood the what? The tree of life. It's the same tree from page two. Check it out. The tree of life is bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and the servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The last page of the Bible, God says, I'm going to take you back to what I designed you for. Yes, I've skipped the middle where we're all broken and we're all messed up. But when you get to the end, to the last page, God says, 
here's the game I designed for you. And now you get to play it forever in love. In love. Now, listen to Jesus, who showed us how to play the game, who reminds us of what, what comes to the winner. Jesus says in Revelation 2, 7, to the one who's victorious, to the winner, I'm going to give the right to eat from what? From the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, that's the game. Want to win it? Well, you got to know three things. Number one, we were never created to die. We were created to live forever. That's why we struggle with death, because we were not made for death. There is no chip in us that has an understanding death program in it. We were never supposed to die. We were made to live forever. Second thing you need to know to win is in James chapter 4, verse 14. You do not even know, the Bible says, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Number two is this, the game is short and we're on the clock. Hey, let me show you what I mean. I, I got a vapor maker here, right? Hey, let me show you your life. You were born, you went to school, you had a family. Oh, you died. Did you miss it? Did you blink? Let me show you your life again. You were born, you went to school, you got a job, oops, <laughs> you died. You didn't even make it to retirement. I talked too slow. I'll tell you this, 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 this stuff smells really good. You got some really good smell in life right here. You're a mist, you're a vapor. Let me show you. What, what is the name of your great, great, great grandfather? Just go back three generations. Just three grandpas in your life. What was your great, great, great grandpa's name? What did he do for a living? Where did he work? You got no clue, do you? Friends, that's your own legacy. That's your own family. And you don't even know his name. He was a mist. I am too. I'm here today, gone tomorrow. You, me, we're but a mist. And we're on the clock. Our short life is our only resume for eternity. Listen, we've been fooled, church. We've got this idea that we can just put God on a post-it note, stick him on our king, and then just make whatever choices we want after that. Play the game by our own rules. And as long as we took a moment to put a sticky God on the king, then we'll all get to heaven and it'll all be okay and all be equal. Do you know where that kind of thinking comes from? It's from Tom and Jerry. It's from cartoons. You know, remember the cats get killed and they all get the same harps, the same clouds? It's cartoon theology, but it's not biblical theology. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's equality in heaven. Sure, we worship the same God. We got the same happiness, the same joy, but in every place where the Bible talks about heaven, it uses terms like ruling, reigning, administering, crowns, thrones, riches, rewards. You get what I mean, right? Because those words are not words of equality. Read Jesus' parable of the talents in Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus knew what heaven was about, so he tells the story about it. He says a king gave three guys, same, guy, same amount of money. One guy took the money, made ten times with it. The second guy makes five times with it. The third guy just buried it. So he can give it back to the king without an increase. So the king rewards the first two guys. Did he give him the same reward? Of course he didn't. Read the parable. The guy who, who messed up, Jesus takes his money, gives it to the guy who had a 10-time return. Listen, catch this. Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. Your short life here, it's the only resume you get for eternity, for the long part of your life. That's it. Life's short. The clock is ticking. Now, I, I know you may be thinking, are you saying that we're going to have to work forever? <laughs> Well, of course I am. We're made to work. The Bible doesn't have anything good to say about laziness. We want to produce. We want to work. Heaven is not sitting on clouds, like trying to figure out how to play harps. That's cartoons. That's not scriptures. We work there and here. And the work we do here for God in this short life matters. It'll get you crowns. Go study the five crowns that you can get in heaven, right? Read 1 Corinthians 9.25, 2 Timothy 4.8, read James 1.12, read 1 Peter 5.4, read Revelation 2.10. Everywhere the Bible talks about what we do in heaven, we're ruling, we're reigning, there's thrones, there's crowns, there's riches, there's rewards, there's mansions, there's rooms. What you do here on the planet in this first square of the game, it matters for forever. 
Last thing, you need to know to win. This is Matthew 6, 19. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is number three, a key to win this game. We must live. You and I must live with eternity in mind. I must think about the other players on the board because eternity is at stake for every person. I must love my fellow players so that they can win the game too. I must invest my money with eternity in mind. How much I pile up in a 401k is not the ultimate goal. It's what gets piled up in eternity that gets rewarded. Listen, your money is monopoly money. It's just for playing this game called life, right? One day you're going to enter eternity and God's going to say, hey, what'd you do with the monopoly money I gave you? Oh, you spent it all on earth? You used it up for yourself? I mean, didn't you read the instructions? I told you, this life is just a short resume for eternity. Listen, don't live this life from now to the grave. Christians don't die. We live forever. Listen, friends, please, 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 please don't tell me that you fell for the lie that says this life is all you've got. Your home is not in Fort Wayne or the city you live in. Your money is not over at Lake City Bank. Your family is not those that just live in your home. This life is a vapor, a mist, all that is going to pass very quickly. Your real home is heaven. Your real treasures are stacked high there, and you have been adopted. You're in the biggest, best family anyone could ever want. You're in the family of God. The tree of life is waiting for you. It's there because you will not live forever here. You, you know those game boards with little squares on them where you roll the dice and move one square at a time? In the game of life, the one I described today, there's trillions of squares. Trillions. More square, squares than you could ever, ever imagine. And this life, this one on planet Earth, it's just square one. What you do on square one affects the rest of the game. It's why Jesus turned to the crowd and he said, this is Luke 9, 24, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus says, you give me that first square, I'll give you the rest. Listen, friends, don't give into that page three problem where you get stuck on square one. Ooh, what looks good? What's pleasurable? No, Jesus says, give me your life. Give me your first square and I'll give you trillions of squares. I'll give you eternity. Let's pray together. God, we thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. You create an entire universe for us. You give us one rule and we ignore it and we make a mess of it. Thank you, God, for protecting us from the tree of life and, and being stuck in our mess forever. And thank you, God, most of all, for sending Jesus to pay the penalty for our rule baking and giving us a chance to win. God, some of us, we've realized so much today. In fact, if that's you today, you've realized a lot. I invite you to just talk to God about how you've played the game of life. Just say to him something just like this right now. Just say, God, I've been playing this game like Ray and Cody play chess. I've been making up my own rules. I've been playing life my own way. And I realized today I've been wrong. Forgive me. Today I want to follow Jesus through the game. I know he died for me. I want to live for him. Forgive me. I want to follow you, God. Would you pray that? Just say, God, forgive me. I want to follow you. And if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you do me a favor? Would you just put hashtag Jesus in the feed right now? We want to help you take your next step. But you know, I can't help you unless I know that you just said yes to Jesus right now. Would you just put hashtag Jesus in the feed right now so I know you prayed that prayer? And I got two more things. If you haven't discovered the gift God gave you when you started to play the game with Jesus, then take our free spiritual gifts test right now and get that figured out. The link is right here below. And if you figured it out, if you've taken our free test, then I'd invite you to live with eternity in mind. You know, figuring out your gift, but not using it, it's like getting a powerful Indy race car and never moving it onto the track. It's just a waste. And what you're going to find out if you don't use your gift is God will remove your gift and give it to someone else. Read Luke 19, Matthew 25. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. It's use it or lose it. If you want to jump in though and become a part of our online team using your gift online, put hashtag serve in the feed right now and we're going to show you how. All right, here's Deanna with more details. Thank you, Ray. Yes, and just to reiterate, the spiritual gift 
tests link is below for you. So jump in on that, just give it uh, 10 minutes and discover your amazing gifts and then put them to use, okay? Hop in on one of our serve teams right away. We can absolutely get you connected with that. Just let us know on that communication card that you wanna jump in and someone will reach out to you this week. Now, if you're brand new with us, thank you so much for checking us out today. Thank you for sticking with us through this uh, message. If you'd like to stay connected with all the messages in this series, you can watch them on demand on our YouTube page, or you can check our website as well at the Point Church. Net. Also, if you're brand new with us, be sure to tell us that you are. We want to be sure to give you a free gift just for being with us today. It's an awesome ebook on marriage and family. It's from our uh, pastor, Ray Harris, that you just heard from today, and we'll uh, send it to you. You just have to let us know where to send it to. So now I have a big warm thank you to those of you who have partnered with The Point Church to help us carry out the mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we can only do this ministry because of your faithful giving. And if you'd like to join others in worship through giving, I invite you to do so through our website at thepointchurch.net slash give. On that site, you'll be able to easily give by credit or debit. Also, there's a super fun uh, text to give option at the number below. It takes 20 seconds once you get everything set up for the first time, or you can even send your gift through the mail or deliver it here in person. Our campus is located at 5335 Bass Road, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46808. We're actually open Monday through Friday, nine to five, and our in-house services are Sundays at nine o'clock, 1015 and 1130. Whether you're virtual here or you're like you're like in our virtual family or you're gathering with us in person, I want you to know that we're so, so glad that you've joined us today. Don't forget about the bracelets, okay? Your best life now, let me take mine off, here we go. Your best life now bracelet, don't forget about it. We will get you one um, if you'll just let us know that you need one. We are challenging you to wear it throughout our series as a reminder of what God wants to do in your life in this season. So don't be shy. Tell us that you want one of these. And finally, be sure to like and subscribe to all the likable and subscribable places, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Pop the notifications on too, uh, so that you can always stay really close when we send out some encouragement to you, okay? We love you. Virtual chicken wing, chicken wing to you. I'll see you next time. Bye.